Greetings, ladies and mantle gents, and welcome to this latest edition of Tales from Outer Space. 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 And as always, I hope that you enjoy. Story number one. Pack of Wolves, written by who do you think? Day one. The great fleet of the Empire had been dispatched to clean up the mess the Seventh Fleet had gotten itself into. It would seem that they can't fight these ugh, humans very effectively, because they're tied down providing fire support for the ground troops. I don't think their incompetence would be tolerated much longer. But for now, orders are to wipe out the human fleet and to end this war quickly. Day 6. We've just arrived in the human-controlled space. I say human-controlled, but there's really not much control going on. The extent of their control is that their ships can slip through our defense systems to resupply their ground troops. Every ship they build is stealthy, but it doesn't seem to do them much good. At least, it won't now that the Emperor's own fleet is around. They did score some victories over the imbeciles in 7th. Day 11. Just past the bulk of 7th Fleet, still bombarding the trees of Terminal 4. If the ground forces were competent, the war would probably be won by now. As comms officer, I had the pleasure of directing all communications with them. Getting in range for EM transmission beams, we can exchange massive amounts of data as compared to the Tachyon Band. Most of it's inane blather, but these humans are a lot better at astrometric warfare than we expected. Usually, a highly coordinated species crumbles once central control is taken out, but they seem to have a concept of decentralized networking. I would be a little scared of it, that we not outnumber them so massively. Day 27. We've run out of fresh rations. It's onto pre-packaged, nutritionally optimized, radio-stabilized, standard-issue crap. It tastes like crap. The Galamar is reporting some engine troubles and has been ordered to turn back. It's a battle cruiser, so no escort has been assigned. It can still proceed at full speed, thankfully. Day 41. The fleet lost communications with the Galamar today. There's not much that we can do at the moment, as there are reports of massed human fleets around Healthier 7. Crap still tastes like crap. Day 42. The Gallimar sent a message requesting the assistance of a light cruiser and three destroyers to tow them back to Imperial space. Their engines died and the surge temporarily took comms offline. My ship, Velimac, is being sent as the light cruiser. We're significantly faster than the Gallimar, so we should arrive in about a week. Day 45. I've started picking up strange tacky impulses coming from a nearby star. They seem to be reflected, and the pattern scanner missed them. But they're there. I converted them to audio, and they're scary as hell. Some kind of call of a wild animal. It sounds... hungry. Day 47. Some responses to the initial calls are coming in. I can't trace the sources because they're reflected off stars, but it seems to be some form of communication. The first pattern I detected is getting faster and faster. I ran it against our database, and it seems that the howl from the Terran animal called a wolf. Big surprise, there are social predators starting to not like this assignment. Day 46. I read about wolves today. The prey on the weak and isolated, and are extremely social. In light of this, the captain has increased the combat speed to beat them to the Gallimar. We should be arriving in two days now, instead of three. Day 47. The chorus is getting louder and faster, with new voices joining in every few hours. This is how wolves gather their packs. The faster they're howling, the closer they are. How they know where to go is a bit of a mystery, as the transmission contains no position data. Now I'll investigate further. Day 48. We've arrived at the site of Gallimard's transmitter. There's a massive debris field which analysis shows can't be less than a week old. The transmitter is attached to some kind of probe that's supplying it with power. The howling is now a cacophony, with at least 20 distinct howls at the same interval and intensity. It seems that they found what they were looking for, and they were looking for us. Having called to battle stations, Mark Log has complete. Personal Logs of Ensign Deomol Horenta, SIS Velimac. Recovered from a data core salvage from the wreckage of that vessel during the Human Senford War. End of story. Story number two. 
Brothers, written by Hader. The following are statements gathered from soldiers present at the Battle of Pyrion 456, which lasted from Gal year 2534-36. Units of time and measurement have been tailored to the viewer's specifications. Look for the full stories of this battle in Two Years of Hell, History of the Coalition's First Expeditionary Force. You know, it's funny. We were all dropped on that barren rock with the same general mission statement. Evict the opposing forces, secure the points of interest, and be home before our home planets completed a cycle. That in itself posed an interesting deadline, since the Brok's cycles are a bit faster. We all decided to take it as a guideline instead of a hard promise. We never shook on anything, after all. Anyway, you didn't drag me down here to talk about planetary cycles. We didn't expect to spend two years on that damned rock. The rest of the coalition forces were handling everything with various shades of, We're going to die! Well, all except the humans. They just grumbled something about being shafted, as usual, and moving on. Frankly, it amazed the rest of us. We rulish were known for our endurance, but the things that they did went far beyond the scope of the word. I saw two wounded humans drag another of their own, unconscious, through almost 100 yards of no man's land. No, I'm not embellishing. You make sure that you get every word written down. I'll not have you dumb down their accomplishments for the general masses. Y yes, you can take that down too. I've been through too much to care about what the general populace thinks. First played Johanna Krolsch, 40 foot swords. Whenever we came back from patrols, we always prayed that we would be next on rotation to the human encampment. What do they call it? Oh, an F.O.B., I think. I never bothered learning what it stood for. And we're being honest here. I was originally skeptical when they were admitted into the coalition. I mean, they were scrawny, pale, scaleless sacks of exposed flesh. You can't blame me for thinking them weak in first sight. Spending two years with them, fighting besides them... I quickly revised my opinion. Have you ever seen something so small engage a raging hudder in close quarters combat? A sight to see, I tell you. Still, that's not the story I was trying to tell. You see, we all wanted to rotate through a human FOB because they always had the best parties. It seemed like every few days, somehow, they managed to pull up a fresh batch of alcohol from somewhere... A miracle, because we weren't due for a resupply for another cycle, and our in-orbit support had been shredded by those ground-to-space guns. By the four-headed one, they could party and drink everyone else under the table while they were at it. If they considered your brother in arms, they would move mountains for you. Literally, in one case. I suppose that's a story for next time, though. Sir Bannock, 15th Warlords. Why, uh, that's a stupid question, don't you think? We were there, and we certainly weren't leaving any time soon, and I'm sure any of them would have done the same. What? They called us crazy. Uh, well, I mean, I guess it's true. Listen, we had the ordinance, the mountain was in the way, and the strike team was on the other side. Uh, they were out of the blast radius. How do we know? Well, <laughs> um, we were bored when we weren't fending off the attacks or out on patrol, so we crunched some numbers using the data that we had collected. We found out how much firepower it would take to remove that mountain and where we would have to put it. Good mental exercise, the lieutenant had called it when he found out. Anyway, sir, uh, they may look ugly as sin, but those Xeno bastards were our brothers at that point. Hell, I could probably tell you how many times a day they crap, since we'd lived so close together. You take four other people, you bet, you know, spend two years in hell with them, and I guarantee you'll come out as close as can be. I remember most of them by name. Ugh, can't spell them worth a damn. <laughs> Too many consonants, sir. Would I change anything? Uh, no, I wouldn't. Not worth the trouble. Besides, sir, I don't know if I could pull off some of those stunts again. I gave one leg helping pull those bastards out of the fire. I'd give the other one in a heartbeat if I had to. Why didn't I go over this? We're brothers, damn it. I don't care if they're two feet taller than me or have scales. 
I've give my other leg, and I'm sure that they'd give, uh, I don't know, uh, their tails or something. It's just how it is. Nothing big. You can't understand, looking from the outside. Nobody back home will understand either. That's fine, though. My brothers will understand, and that's good enough for me. Lance Corporal James Torg O'Shaughnessy, 1st Marine Division. End of story. The algorithm reckons you should be watching this video next, and I recommend that you should be always watching my video. So, click and click with energy! And yes, clicking that does help the channel. Thank you very much. I just want to quickly thank the T5 channel members and patrons. Alithia, Barky, Beauty Cure, Meridian117, Cam Maxwell, Casper Arnholtz, Albard and Gusta, Savage Patch Papa, 